Anyway, so it seemed like it would be a good time to discuss uh, broadly the themes of the program, uh, where people thought we should be going, uh, where perhaps people think we shouldn't be going, uh, and uh, basically think about fruitful avenues for future progress. Uh, so I've just listed over here uh, some of the big themes of the program. Of course, there are uh, other things you could add entanglement to the other program. Uh, and uh, this week, uh, of course, is our uh, Black Hole Information Focus Week, so we could start with uh, thoughts on that, but more broadly, people could make comments on, on the other things. Uh, and, uh, well, when we get to the question of decoding the hologram, uh, let me just mention, uh, you know, clearly that is one of the big themes in the subject, and many people assume that the ADS-CFT fine-grained equivalence is the answer. Okay. But if that is the answer, there's a question of how we use that answer. Uh, and that's really a test of whether it is the answer, in my opinion. Uh, so here's at least one attempt to formulate a uh, challenge along those lines, uh, which one could refine. So uh, I don't think we have anything else in particular to say, unless you do, Ted. Uh, we could, I think, no. No? we could open it up to uh, comments, thoughts, Questions, statements of protest, uh, whatever. So. So, I guess I, I have a question. Uh, <clears throat> it's sort of, well, one of the sort of things I've learned and heard a lot about in this program is the whole idea of code subspaces, you know, error correction, that there's a whole bunch of states out there in the field theory which are not really relevant for a lot of the supergravity uh, um, analysis in the bulk. Um, and so then I was just wondering, I mean, in Ted's talk yesterday, he also had sort of a new proposal, I thought, for how everything could be consistent without firewalls, and that maybe the radiation that we see in the bulk is not in a pure state, but the whole thing is because of something else. And so I was just wondering, could they, something else be this sort of stuff that's outside the code subspace? And, um, I don't think you listed that as one of your options at the end for where the information is hiding, but it um, occurred to me that that might be a possibility. So well, it's a code subspace, not a code tensor factor, right? Um, so is, we normally think of information as being in a subsystem, which is a, a factor of the Hilbert space. The code is supposed to be a, the, this Hilbert, the code subspace would mean the Hilbert space the direct sum of stuff that's in the code and stuff that isn't in the code. Okay, so the subspace is literally some sub-manifold in the Hilbert space or something? Yeah, it's, it's not a vector space. space. It's a vector it's space. Hilbert. It's closed under addition. It is a vector space. Yeah. Oh. Subspace means subspace. Yeah. Well, okay. So what's the problem if it's a subspace? Well, it's not a tensor factor. It's a direct, it's a piece of a direct sum. Um, but the and those aren't the same thing. But the quantum field theory of space. What? The quantum field theory of space, I would say, is a tense factor. Yeah, but not right, but not in, well, up to these gauge issues, but yes. So that means that, that actually quantum field theory of space contains very little of the Well, very little of what? what do you mean by that? You mean, well, the, but when you say the quantum field theory of well, space. Well, maybe they're in an entangled state, so you can't even distinguish where they sit. I mean, in, so I, I should clarify that uh, I've never argued that there are CFT states that don't have bulk interpretations. I think all CFT states should have bulk interpretations. So that's not the way that the quantum error correction proposal works. Um, but, but some of them are not low energy, or some of them. Yeah, so are some of them have black holes. But but I, I, that's still a black. That's still a bulk interpretation. It, mm -hmm. It's just that. You know, it's a, it might have, you know, some of, you know, I mean, the, you know, a typical high energy state is some huge black hole, but I mean, that's still some, I mean, I still know what it is. And, and yeah, well, but you cannot distinguish between two of them. Black bulk, um, black bulk, usual low energy bulk. Uh, that's correct. Yeah, yeah. And so, 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 and so, yeah, maybe it's worth emphasizing that the, although we often say the code subspace, we really mean a code subspace. So the, there's no unique code subspace. You can pick whichever one you want. And then you can ask on that subspace, you know, to, w to what extent is there bulk effective field theory? And so, so for example, um, 
you know, you know, into what you know, how good is the code for, for whichever subspace we pick, and it can be better or worse depending on which one you pick. And uh, so, for example, if you you can consider the sub the subspace of states where, um, you know, there's a huge black hole of radius 100 EDS radii sitting in the center, and you can just consider the the set of all states you get like that. Um, and and you still there's still quantum error correction working outside the black hole, explaining you know the fact that. You know, operators that are outside have different representations of the boundary at the same time, um, and so you can then keep making the black hole bigger, and you know, and, and, you know the code sort of gets worse and worse because the the protected information is just getting closer and closer to the boundary, and so it's getting hard. You know, the, you can erase it by smaller and smaller errors, and at some point you're just back to the whole CFD Hilbert space. Uh, but are you? How do you think about the states of the black hole in that language? Well, they're there. I mean, so you, so for example, in, in well, to be if you want something concrete in these tensor network models, you you can just remove some tensors. So 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 we had uh, so you have this linear map. So 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 in the version where there's not a black hole, you have the subspace of perturbative excitations in the bulk, which is gotten by this this pentagon network with a dangling leg off of each tensor. And, that, and that's some small subspace of the Hilbert space, which, if you like, is the no black hole subspace of the Hilbert space. Mm -hmm. um, and now, if you want to start making black holes, what you can do is you can start removing tensors. And each time I remove a tensor, I'm replacing <coughs> one input leg with five input legs. So the Hilbert <coughs> space is getting bigger. Yeah. Uh, and you know, eventually, I remove all of them. And then I've got just back the CFD Hilbert space again. So I've accounted for everything. But, you know, and, and, and you can see that you know. When I remove them, right, I get an object whose entropy is going like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 well, the black holes can't be all of those because some of those. Would That's have correct. Have been That's correct. So you no so you subtract the so you do you direct subtract the part where it, where you just put the tensor back in. But still underlying this, there's a equality, so to speak, or one-to-one -one map between the Hilbert spaces. That's correct. That yeah. So that, yeah, that was the point I wanted to make. Is so 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 uh, in this way, I can account for all states in the CFT with the bulk picture. Yeah, yeah. But if I if I understand correctly, I mean, I've always subscribed to this sort of you know strict ADS CFT where yes, the Hilbert spaces agree mm -hmm. in the bulk and the boundary, so there is a one-to-one -one map between them. Mm -hmm. But it's not true that every state of quantum gravity in the bulk has a nice sort of semi-classical space-time. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. right. So the way I like to think so about that is that it has to do with the observables. So so we can we can define gauge invariant bulk observables, but they don't have to make sense in all the states. So so, so in, sorry, in the sorry, sorry, what, what do you mean they don't have to make sense in all the states? Well, they don't have to make sense in all the states. For example, if you have a so you well to make them gauge invariant you have to address them. So there's some long story about this, but. But you could have some plank soup, for example. Well, yeah, but roughly, for example, say, say, mm -hmm. I, say, say I have an operator which is arranged so that near the vacuum it's just sitting in the center of the ball. And now, now I consider a state where the, there's a black hole there, which is 10 to the 500 ADS radii in diameter. So there are, actually, there are a lot of states like that, a lot more than there are near the vacuum. Um, but I don't really expect this operator to make any sense in those states. I mean, you know, even someone who falls into the horizon isn't going to be able to see no, this but operator. But the operator doesn't act on the whole Hilbert space, and it only acts on a certain Well, subspace. you can extend it to the whole Hilbert space, but in some arbitrary way. I mean, if you're it's only, an you're only, no, no, I don't yeah, think So you're only interested in how it acts on, on the subspace of states where it's sort of accessible to some bulk observer, and it's not far behind some horizon. So, 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 so that, so, and actually, the way that so the statement is, it only acts like the bulk semi-classical notion you thought you were modeling in a limited class of states. That's correct. Yeah. yeah. And, and so, in that, so basically, the the bigger you take your code subspace, the fewer observables there are that work on all of the states. They work as you would have expected. They work as you would have so expected I, on yeah. all of the I states. I mean, maybe just a different way to say that, but I, I would like to think of this as, as yeah, I mean, the, because there is a one-to-one -one mapping between the Hilbert between the states in the Hilbert space, yeah. so 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 it's not like that operator cannot be like I cannot talk about acting that operator in the vacuum, acting to a very highly excited state. Yes, I but can, it doesn't. But but, but you shouldn't you shouldn't space. presume to know what its properties are. So for example, the thing that we explained is that one thing you you, you know naively people you know uh, some you know some some people might have thought that. That operator that you define in the center should somehow commute with operators near the boundary and as, as an operator equation in the Hilbert space, uh, but that can't be true, and and so we we proved it can't be true, or well, maybe proved is a strong word. We 
argued, I think, convincingly that it can't, that it can't be true. Um, but I think the, the important point is that it doesn't need to be true, right? That, 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 that in yeah. these states where it's you know, far behind the horizon, it, it's too much to ask for, for, for it to still commute with all the local operators of the town. Well, it's, it's too much to ask for that even in the states where it's not behind the horizon. Um, because if you have a given definition of how to throw a geodesic down towards the center, that's right. It could be a, a bulk semi-classical geometry. Right. The geometry is so highly curved that your bulk geodesic actually bends in some way, and it's close to a boundary, and is in fact causally related to part of the boundary that you thought it was going to be space-like. Um, that, that's correct. Yeah. So even right, that, 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 that's, a, that's a more sort of subtle but but correct uh, way way in which you can think about this. Right. Yeah. So, so yes. I, 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 I love the summary you're giving of your work right now, but. The other day in Ted's talk, you seemed to make a point that what you were saying was that you needed some kind of error correcting code that couldn't just be the imposition of the bulk you know, gravitational constraints. Um, and if the two Hilbert spaces are equal, I don't know what you mean by that statement. Well, I guess it depends what you mean by the bulk gravitational constraints. So, so okay, so so here, here's something which I claim is a fact, although although. I guess we, we, we just quoted it in the paper rather than giving a calculation. Yeah. But if, if you if you define operators in the bulk by geodesics from yeah. the boundary, then to all orders in perturbation theory, they commute with all local operators on the boundary on a boundary Cauchy surface, except for the one where the geodesic ends. Yeah, okay. Okay, so that's some non-trivial fact. It, it's, it's not as easy to prove as it is in Arctic dynamics. It's some annoying calculation. Um, so so that, that's what the constraints would tell you. That, the, the, that that's the, so, so. But but that so that's some non-locality, but it's not enough non-locality. So I claim that in the CFT, um, you can't have the, this. The operator that represents this operator in the bulk can't actually commute with all the operators in a time slice except for at one point. And your last comment is true. You claim that you can't do that even at infinite n if you require it to happen to all orders in the Winterberg expansion. Uh, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. In all, but in all states. So the, the one over n expansion is very subtle if we try and use it in all states. One over n expansion is subtle if we try to use it in all states. Yeah. Exactly. So, so that's what I mean. I mean, as an operator equation, not evaluate. So, so a one over n expansion in an operator equation really means small in the operator uh, norm, which this, is a very we strong statement. We can talk about statement. this in more detail another time. But I, yeah. as you said, you have a set of states where it commutes exactly. Yeah. And the extension beyond that set of states is arbitrary. So if I take the extension to just be zero in the orthogonal complement of the code subspace, it seems I get exact commutivity. No, I think you can't. You can't. You can't. No, you can't. You can prove in quantum field theory that you can't have this. Yeah. So what goes wrong with this? Well, maybe oh, so, I, so I have so to I draw a picture. I mean, I, we want to have, if we want the whole talk about this, this like time slice. slice. But, but I think that well, the, there's a grown-up version of the time slice axiom because you have to deal with this point. So, 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 okay. so roughly what you argue is uh, you use the time slice axiom plus hog duality to argue that if you have an operator that on a, that a, a non potentially non-local operator that commutes with all <laughs> local operators except at one site on a time slice in one location, yeah. then it's actually a local operator at that site. Okay, but that's inconsistent with bulk causality because you know that this there are there are points on the other side of yeah. the thing so where it can't commute with. Them. I, I always get confused. They're space like separated in the CFT. I always get confused in this and discussion about whether this discussion is being held at finite n, or there is, whether this is really a discussion at, at, in the infinite n limit in a 1 over n expansion. No, I want, I want to be at large with finite n. I, I, well, but, but then it's a different story. No, but then, so that, but then, I, then I work finite in... finite n, we agreed that in the, from the bulk point of view, there's no reason to expect this computation. The commutivity only happens. No, but you at expect it to be end. small. You expect it, 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 so so. It, it, well, it's, it's a well-known fact that small. at finite n, perturbation theory is a good approximation. There's a question of what small means. So, so e to minus n squared. But in all states or in no, not in all states. states. So no, the, the whole point is not okay. in all states. But that's an that's not a statement about the constraints. That's my point. The, this restriction on the states is yeah. not something that comes from the constraints of general relativity. It's an additional restriction that you put in. No, we just agreed that there are states of semi-classical general relativity where the commutator will be large. Um, there are states where the metric is such that if you try to run in a space like geodesic, it won't end up in the center. Yeah. You, you aim well, it in some way, the no, curvature is, and it'll look, come around you, close you to you the You changed boundary. what you mean by no, semi-classical general yeah. relativity. I you, haven't. Yeah, yeah, I think you have, because 
first we were talking about the one over n expansion of large n Yang Mills theory, which corresponds to perturbative diagrams around the EDS space, and asking us to talk about semi classical deformations of the metric that are large. That's, so that's something that goes outside the one over n expansion. Well, there, there, there are various points depending on what you do with sources, of course. Yeah. For the, for the theory. And I'm trying to track what I thought Dan was doing. Uh -huh. If we stick to things that are perturbatively close to ADS, or states that are near the vacuum, then we yeah. lie in Dan's code subspace, and there's no issue with this commutivity. Um, yeah, so I mean, to some extent, I, you, you could say that I'm making a straw man, because, because you know, the argument, I mean, it's it just intended to, to highlight the fact I mean, you, you can, of course, just say, well, I knew all along from the bulk point of view that I only wanted to talk about a subspace. Yeah. But the idea is to, to give you a different way of thinking about that that's more rigorous. <laughs> and the language is lovely, and I like the realization that I was trying to understand whether there was a sharp statement that really there is, that, that this is so not... The, I can't, the sharp I can't statement interpret is, what you're saying as a way of thinking about imposing the bulk constraints. So there's more, really more physics. Well, so the sharp statement is, if you take... To all orders in perturbation theory, the yeah. consequences of the around the vacuum. Yes. As you, you, as you, you take you take those the algebra, algebra and then you just declare that that should be true as at the level of the operator algebra and the CFT, you get a large contradiction. Yeah, at large but finite n. Right. And, Absolutely. And 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 it's a contradiction even if you say, oh, this algebra holds up to non-perturbative small directions. That won't that won't save you from the contradiction. There, so, so the oper at the level of the operators, the violations need to be order one. Order um, one in, in some of, states. Okay. That's what I mean by an operator equation. It means I, I can I, find I, some but, state where. But, 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 so but order we one also one. know just from gauge theory that there are many states of the gauge theory in which the one over n expansion, as usually formulated, just fails. Yes, that's right. Because you you yeah. excited n squared degrees of freedom um, and yeah. so on. That's right, but there you know so there there were people who thought that even in states like that, these commutators should still be small. Right. Um, so bringing so, this back to other themes, can we? Uh, does it help us with black hole information, say, with the one along the lines Ted suggested, or other ones? Gives a nice model. It would be a world. great resolution. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I think that would be terrific. We, we get nice smooth yeah. horizons. We get you know Terry. Uh, well, okay. one of the one of the challenges. He, he said you can't reproduce semi-classical physics inside the horizon. That's not a smooth horizon. To be clear, I said oh. far behind the horizon. Uh, so, so, so the, yeah, the details are not clear. Everything is corresponding to the ADS scale. Yes, good, right. So, so, and, and that's all. And to describe the smooth horizon, all you need is an ADS scale because you only list less for an ADS time. Yep. So, 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 so it's clear. I think, I think it's clear that you can't describe things that are way inside the horizon on the nice slice. Okay, I think that we probably is rigorously established. I mean, I think people rigorously probably rigorously established. I mean, it's certainly not there in your model. I think, I don't, I'm not sure there's a theorem. Uh, the model can't well, be. No, I know. I think it is because 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 it, because then you would say that if you thought that you could go arbitrarily far in on the nice slice, then the then you would say that by shooting these long geodesics, I can make something that commutes with everything on the boundary except the point, even in these highly excited states, um, and that's not allowed in the CFT. But can you describe the physics of an informing observer up to the point that he gets close no. to? Well, that's a harder question. But let's let's first let's first decide about this crude question. No, if, if the black hole is, I mean, depends what you're, you're doing. If the black hole is formed by collapse, then everything inside it is in causal contact with the boundary. It's all in the future of the boundary. Um, yeah, yeah, but no, but but that that's not the. I have to draw a picture. I mean, that that's not the way we think about it, right? You you you, you we're talking to fixed time, so. So, so you want to, uh, right, like here, here's the shell that goes in. Uh, although in principle, to talk about generic states, we should also be allowed to build it up slowly. But, yeah. Um, and now we're looking at the Hilbert space way up here. Yeah. Okay. And now the question is, is so it's true that by, by, I think, well, maybe you can correct me, that by, by shooting a space-like geodesic from the boundary here, yeah. If I shoot it for long enough, I, I can get all the way over here. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Isn't that what Lenny was talking about, for example? For example. Well, that wasn't a geodesic. 
He does well, that. Yeah, this is, I mean, so, so, so there is an operator. It doesn't have to be a G. So, 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 and then I think to all orders in perturbation theory, yeah. this operator has the property that it commutes with everything at the boundary except at the endpoint of the geodesic. Okay? Mm -hmm. Now, yes, I agree. So now that kind of suggests that um, this operator should have that property in any state. But that would be impossible just by unitarity in the, C unitarity in the CFT. We don't need to invoke error correcting code models to see that it's not possible. Um, right? The, the operator is in causal contact it's in the future of the CFT. So there's something. That well, but I mean, it's I mean the, the the evolution back to here is some big mess, right? I mean, so so I, I mean I'd rather not try and do bulk evolution. I mean, the point is I can make this argument without doing bulk evolution. I just look at the Hilbert space at a fixed time. Okay. And, and I say that you can't, I mean, of course, anything that's true, probably there's more than one way of, of arguing that it's true. But one way of arguing that it's true is that I can't have an operator with this property in the CFD. But I don't find so. That, that, that was what I claimed was the rigorous. What's the difference the from the error correcting properties in the outside case? I mean, it, it looks like commuting with everything, but actually it's not. It's, no, because no, because there the excuse was there's a whole bunch of states where actually it doesn't commute, okay? But, including things like this. Yeah, yeah, and so usually what I would say is that set of states where it doesn't have to commute includes this one. If I if I don't say that, I don't think the proposal can work. Yeah. So then you said that uh, it's um it's a long calculation. So to what extent it works the properties of ADS uh, Schwarzschild? Uh, Oh, no, well, this is the, the, cal okay, the calculation I actually did was just in the vacuum, but I think, I think, it, I think it should, should work. I, th I mean, there's a, I think from the point of view of the path integral, it kind of makes sense that it's more general. I think Will and Steve were also thinking about this. But you, so, I mean, the calculation I actually did was you work, you work in Pfefferman gram gauge and, you know, Poincaré slicing of ADS. This is just the, to, to make it easy. And then, you, and then you look at the commutator of this guy and that guy. And then you ask whether or not it's local uh, in the x direction. Mm -hmm. Okay, and that's a amusing exercise in direct brackets. And and it's not it's not obvious that it's going to be local in the x direction yeah. because um, well to compare right so in electromagnetism the analog would be would be Pfefferman would be um, like axial gauge. Okay, and then here the commutator of the constraints doesn't involve any x derivatives. Right, because this is a this is just a Laplacian, so then it's going to be local automatically. Its inverse will be local automatically in the x direction, so the drag brackets will be local in the x direction. But, but do that argument is false in gravity, so so you need a better argument to argue that these aren't. Yeah, what happens if there are deviations from? I mean, we have uh, evolving geometry. What happens then? Does yeah, so so it? what I showed was to all orders in so I showed to all orders in perturbation theory in general relativity that and actually including higher derivative operators that that these can be so there's an ancient argument, and maybe Tom can tell me the extent to which it's a theorem or just a hand wavy argument, that if you use a covariant gauge, uh -huh. then to all orders in perturbation theory around any background, you'll find, you know, you'll find microcausality in that covariant gauge, basically um, because you can't change the light cones perturbatively. Uh, no, no, I mean, no, I mean, you could easily do something like, so, I mean, for example, if I did Coulomb gauge. No, 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 I said in a covariant gauge. And my point is that oh. you're using a gauge invariant operator that I could express in terms of covariant gauge things. Yeah, but it would be non-local. It would be non-local, yeah. but he's only doing equal time commutators, and it's non-local along the line he's drawn. Well, yeah, I kind so of. So that tells you where the non-locality is. I mean, I mean it's space-like separation. I mean, you, you, I no. don't want it to just be exactly equal time. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's space-like separation sorry, and, and equal time is not the same thing at I, I, all. I, I'm sorry, I, I withdraw that comment, but the point is, it's non-local along a particular line he's drawn. That no, in perturbation theory no, lives at a certain no, place no, in the background. No, no, no. If you let the thing evolve with the Heisenberg equations of motion yeah. yes. to all other points that are space-like separated, you get non-locality all over the place. Yeah, this non-locality will wait, spread. Wait, wait. But, yeah. It spreads causally, though, if you have a if you have a causal gauge, if you have a covariant gauge. From um, the causally line. Causally from the point and the line. From, the point and the line. Causally from, from, yeah, the, from line. the point and the line. From the line. Right, right. right. which is what we want. Okay. Now, the other thing that's true in all covariant gauges is the Hilbert space is not a Hilbert space. It's a it's a space with negative metric always has to be. This is also true. And that that the commutator algebras are different in that Hilbert space than in the space of gauge invariant states, 
which in GR doesn't include anything local. But it's just a restriction, right? If I get zero in the bigger space, I must get zero in the space of gauging area of states. You can't even talk about these local operators in the space of gauging area of states. No, no. The commutator algebra, which is obviously, obviously satisfying microcausality, is indeed an algebra of gauge-dependent operators. However, the gauge invariant operators are a subset of those things. At least if we believe, there are some issues about whether the prescription that Dan, you were given in terms of geodesics, perhaps really defines something that is a truly gauge invariant BRST invariant operator to be reformulated in this gauge. But if I assume that it can. There is a construction that can. Well, sorry, I'm done. I think you do agree that, I mean, on the gauge invariant subspace of states, I mean, anything I do in the center is going to have to not commute with the Hamiltonian, right? Yes. So then I don't understand what you're saying. It doesn't. All I'm saying is. Yeah, my thing doesn't. Exactly. But I thought you were saying something else. No, all I was saying is that, you know, you talk about this being a grungy calculation. Yeah, you're saying there's another way of doing the calculation. Which is a slick calculation. There may be a slick step. But it can't be too slick because it has to see that it doesn't commute on this line, right? But it will. It will. The point is that if you work in a covariant gauge, then you get microcausality for the gauge-dependent operators. Then the trick would be to write your observable, which is gauge invariant, as a gauge invariant combination of gauge-dependent things. Good, but that's hard for these, right? I mean, so, of course, I thought about that, right? So in electromagnetism, you can just draw the Wilson line and declare it gauge invariant. But here, I mean, you have to deal with that. It's actually not. There's also an issue of higher order of superdivision. Right, yeah, I mean, this genus could, like, do that or something, right? I mean, so. But you choose it not to. You're defining the operator perturbably. No, but if I define it gauge invariantly, then it has to depend on the metric everywhere in the space time. Because there's some background where the geometry works. No, no, but not perturbably. That's why I had to do perturbation theory. Even in perturbation theory, there's an issue with these kinds of operators because they're non-polynomial functions of the local fields in perturbation theory. Every order of perturbation theory, they need a new definition to remove divergences. They are not well-defined order by order in perturbation theory. There's an infinite sequence of coefficients. And, you know, whether or not you can always choose those coefficients so that the things will continue to commute, and it's a non-convergent series, and whether that means anything about commutation, it's just not. These, you know. Is what you're saying true in electromagnetism, too? No, in electromagnetism, if you use Wilson lines, we know exactly what the renormalization consists of. There's an exponential of an infinite constant times the length of the Wilson line. How about non-abelian? Even for non-abelian. Even for scalar fields. Even for non-abelian. The thing that's analogous to this in ordinary gauge theory is to define the unitary gauge fields in a covariant gauge where the theory is renormalizable. And the unitary gauge fields don't exist order by order in perturbation theory because they're non-polynomial functions of the covariant gauge fields, and they need a new subtraction at each order in perturbation theory, multiple new subtractions. So in Pfefferman ground gauge, these are polynomial. It's just the metric and the fields. It doesn't involve the inverses of the metric? Well, no, but the metric inverse in perturbation theory is polynomial, right? Because you're... It's polynomial order by order. It's polynomial. That's right. No, no, but that means that at each order, there's a new composite operator that you have to renormalize the Green's functions of. Sure. Okay. So defining this thing involves an infinite number of subtractions. In each order of perturbation theory, it's a finite number. The number grows. The number in general involves all operators that have the same naive scaling dimension in the free theory that you're perturbing around and the same set of polynomials. You're just giving a problem if I want to talk about that field. But let's just talk about this field and this field. So this is this polynomial. I'm just looking at this in some particular coordinates in Pfefferman's ground gauge. That's what this operator is. Right. But that can't be that. I mean, 
Write, write a covariant expression for it. But that's a mess, yeah. I agree. Yeah, no, no, if it's a mess, what does it mean it's a mess? Is it a polynomial mess? To no, 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 no. It is okay. Not. So then you have the problem that I just but said. That, if you try and do the calculation that way, but if you do it this way. No, I'm just responding, oh, responding, responding to what to Don okay. said. I see. Okay. Okay. I'm not objecting to the calculation okay. as you said you did. But, but if you do things this way, don't you have to carry out, I mean, isn't the point that you have to carry out the renormalization in this gauge? As a Sorry? Point? Well, yeah. the, the point is, I, I thought your point was that if you if you appeal to the expressions in this gauge, then you have to carry out this whole renormalization in this gauge. Well, you, you can't appeal to the you, one in covariant. You gauge. certainly can appeal to the covariant um, the covariant gauge, obvious com local commutivity, and so on and so forth. I see what you mean. Because okay. the things are not defined. Well, yeah, that was a comment about this point. So, sorry, so about the, the like the uh, difference between the gauge theory and the gravity case. I think you can see that explicitly in the tensor network that the gauge there is some gauge symmetry there in the tensors, uh, but it's it fundamentally different from the gauge from the gauge theory. Uh, because uh, um, so so you have these tensors and the gauge symmetries are like doing some transformations on the on the left, which correspond to some transformations here. And uh, the intrinsic difference from gauge field case is in the gauge field you're doing gauge transformations on these points, and that gauge invariant point is made by a vector potential, which is like like two point point. It's something behind um, um, link between two points. And here, the gauge environment point is made by these kind of things, which are four points, which are, uh, it depends on the four points. Each point can be transformed by a gauge environment. And that's the, that's the reason that if I want to write a gauge environment operator, I cannot just draw a loop. I, uh, it has to be like specifying the gauge at every point. That in in, in every the gravity point. case. In gravity <coughs> point. So, 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 so that's one of the features captured by your models. Yeah, so, so that's, that's, that's interesting. So, so, so that you see that, that if you want to, well, what are the operators like uh, somewhere here? Uh, if I write it back to the whole Hilbert space, it's not a local operator, but it's a local operator times projection on, on all other points. It's projecting all other tensors to a fixed value, which means you set that that so, 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 So it seems like these kind of things can I think they can be defined even if you are here. There is no, uh, I don't see why like tensor network cannot define these slides. Um. <coughs> like, like I will have one network describing that slide, and this is another slide which describes the same bit, and they are related by gauge transformation. Well, no, I, yeah. I, so, so in, I mean, to be clear, you know, so so the operator I described is not does not have the form you said because the so the two the two operators I drew on the board commute with each other. Yeah. Uh, whereas the ones you wrote probably don't, because they have those projections on all the sites. Ah, so so probably we want identity and y and then project on other sites. Um. Well, the, <laughs> no, the, no, the projection is only on that line somehow or something, right? You see the the. But, but I thought you can't just, just I, I, this on I can. Time, I, uh, no, no, not, no, not, yeah, but I'm, I'm not worried about non perturbatively. I'm just talk, talking about imperturbation theory. The, those two operators commute to all orders in perturbation theory. Yeah. So I think they are like this. Like you, have, you still need the projection that's setting the background. But you can leave enough room for, for, <laughs> for having both operators satisfying the computer. This is identity in that point. Right? So you have. Something here and the identity. I mean, there. The, the, the thing I said you can't have is an operator in the CFT that commutes with everything except at one point, but isn't a local operator at that point. That's that's the only claim I, I um, Commute with everything except at one point. Yeah, but isn't a local operator at that point. Mm -hmm. Dan, that do, you, yeah. do you know what the renormalization properties in the Pfefferman ground gauge of this operator you've defined are? In other words, what you have to do to all orders in perturbation theory to make it a finite operator. I mean, and, and um, let's, you know, I, I'm giving you the fact that we can add counter terms to GR to the Lagrangian, and we're not we're not going to worry about that. Well, I mean, I didn't really do any calculations, but I think it's like, I mean, I guess what I would say is you smear them a little bit in the coordinates, and that's enough to make them finite in correlation functions. That's not usually the case. Well, uh, yeah, you know, yeah, I mean, fi finite, but, fi I mean, 
finite, but I mean large, because the, 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 the mm -hmm. amount that I smeared over will replace the, the divergences. Um, and then if you want to make things that are independent of the smearing, then indeed you have to do some operator normalization. But if, if you're asking what does that operator normalization look like, I'm not sure I can say anything particularly precise. In, in normal local field theory, we don't have to think about s smearing. I take an operator phi of x, mm. and I commute its, compute its Green's functions to all orders, doing whatever renormalization of the Lagrangian I have to do. Yeah. to get finite answers, and then I find one extra divergence that can be shown to all orders in perturbation theory corresponds to just multiplying the operator by a constant. That's true. And that's not true oh, sorry, if that's there not are true a bunch for composite of, operators. That's, that's right. For that, uh, fundamental that's right. And for composite operators, what's subtract. true is you, you have a whole set of operators of the same um, dimension and the same quantum numbers, and the renormalization constant becomes a matrix in that space. Well, no, okay. you can mix. I mean, you can mix with things with different dimension because you can have powers that are cut off, right? So you can have, in, you know, in five times phi, you can have the identity, um, and which you subtract off if you're trying to get the low energy piece of, of phi squared. Um, okay. Sure. Well, right. you can use Dimrag, yeah. Yeah. Uh, Dimrag, yeah. yeah. Dimrag is for phenomenologists. Yeah. What? Uh, <laughs> well, I mean, you can in covariant gauges. You can do Dimrag in quantum gravity too. I mean, took development did it. Yeah, but it doesn't it make any sense. You know that, right? I mean, it's, a, it's it only makes sense because it's equivalent to things that make sense. I learned that from a tuff. That's what he told me. He says he doesn't teach it in his class because it's too confusing. Okay. <laughs> No, that doesn't make sense. It doesn't make physical sense. Of course, it makes mathematical sense. No, it gives those divergence, yeah. which, which are for sure there. And okay, discards the rest, which can be. No, but it throws out physical things. It throws out. I mean, quadratic divergences yes. are real physical effects. That's. And that's no. there are all sorts of wrong <laughs> papers where people try and say that you know somehow they're not there because of Dimrag. Yeah, yeah, no, they're there, but they are. Uh, this is something sensitive. I mean, which is not yeah. described by your effective field theory. So that's yeah. something sensitive to to to, to completion. I thought the usual rule was that power law divergences can depend on your normalization scheme. So if you have one where they're set to zero, that's that's fine. You can sort of throw them away in an unambiguous. No, but that just means you have you. you Okay, I don't. Want, this shouldn't become a discussion. Yeah, about let's that, broaden the <laughs> discussion both in subject and in people. Yeah, yeah okay. sorry. Without changing the topic completely, I just wanted to raise a question that personally I don't think anybody's going to have a good answer for, but it should be voiced, which is, what about the case with no boundary? So we're all talking like the bulk Hilbert space got to be equal to the CFT Hilbert space. It's just a matter of understanding exactly what that means. But don't we believe that if there's that it makes sense to do quantum gravity in a space without boundary? And or not. Maybe maybe the answer is no, we don't believe that. But if we do believe that, then um, doesn't that mean that even if there is a boundary, there must be stuff that doesn't refer to the boundary inside the bulk? In which case, the bulk Hilbert space somehow would not be equivalent to the CFT, presumably. So I, don't, I just wanted to voice the question. If you guys want to now move on, <laughs> that's OK. But I'd be very happy to hear a reaction or a suggestion. I mean, if we if we phrase everything in terms of the scattering matrix, why do we even talk about the bulk filter space? Um, well, what is the scattering matrix in the case that he's talking case. about? It's the plastic case? No, no, he's <coughs> talking, about, about, the talking oh, about the sitter space. Oh, OK. So no. I, I think the sitter space is, is not really <coughs> that much of an issue because of the fact that the the <coughs> physical, the causally connected region of the sitter space, that does have a boundary. And, and if you're if you're someone who thinks in this this holographic way, the theory of disorder space would just be defined on that diamond. You mean the horizon? Yeah, yeah the, the horizon, and there would be this issue of how do you, you know, have <laughs> descriptions that are compatible with between observers that have different horizons. But there would there would be a boundary. I could Other kinds of no boundary. Um, cosmologies may or may not exist. Mm -hmm. I don't know how to define, I mean, what we've learned from straight theory and ADS-CFT is that we know how to define theories of quantum gravity 
for spaces that have these asymptotic boundaries. I would claim that for de Sitter space with large enough radius, I think there's a, a, a sensible proposal that effectively puts in a boundary. But for generic, you know, like a collapsing cosmology that expands and recollapses, I'm not sure we'll ever have a, a, a sensible quantum I, theory. I think it's a question. I don't. I don't I, mean, I, I don't agree that the city space has a good boundary because I mean, when we look in ADS, we can work on the boundary because it's a asymptotic region that we can keep fixed and where we have very good control of what the geometry is. And if you go, I mean, the city space has a horizon. Mm -hmm. And then, so if I would declare the horizon to be my boundary, I mean, that would be like working on the horizon of a black hole. And we know that that's not a very good place to sit and put your theory. I mean, it's simply not a, uh, even I mean, in ADS, we I know that when we start putting, try to put something on the horizon of the ADS black hole, we lose control I of what, what is going on. So I think, I think. There, there is a good analogy, and that the, you're, you're absolutely right that if you just think about the generic state of the theory, then de Sitter space doesn't have interesting physics. But the way you make interesting physics is by poking holes in it. The same way that, in a way that I think you and I are close to agreement on. <coughs> You understand what's going on inside a black hole by poking holes. Yeah, yeah. This I, this I understand. Uh, okay. So, so. But then I'm not sure that the holographic perspective is the one that is uh, the right one because then you're working in a Hilbert space which is very large. Which I mean, in ADS space we can do things well because we are close to the ground state. So we know that at, at infinity we have space time into the ground state. Right. Well, if you're inside a black hole, you know you have all these other states right. around, and then and you're and doing and it in, in, in the middle of the space. We know the ground state has a, a huge entropy. And so it's similar. And in, in our theory of asymptotically flat space, asymptotically flat space also has a huge Hilbert space of degrees of freedom that you don't see in the S matrix, but which decouple. Tom, can you elaborate the on the word ground state has a large entropy? Yeah, yeah. empty de Sitter space has a large entropy. Well, that's on how you that the ground state is a pure and, state. And if you, yeah. excuse me, okay, there is a vacuum quote configuration empty de Sitter space that has a large entropy. And the most interesting thing about this statement is if you put a local excitation in it, you decrease the entropy. Yeah. Uh, yes, I agree. That's okay. very confusing. Yeah. It's not confusing. It's the clue to the whole story. Right. Okay. Yes. It's no, but I think then it's wrong to call the sitter space the ground state. Yeah, that's what I was asking. Is it the ground state, state of a Hamiltonian? Or no, or? it's not an excited state. Yes, of course. Sorry, what, what, is the, what is this entropy? This is not an entanglement entropy between two regimes. Sorry? Entropy, well, what is that? Is it's it? not entanglement. It's a combination. Well, unless you put it, there's another side of the decision space. Yeah, and yeah. You, might you can about think it. of it as entanglement with another oh, okay. side. Yeah. But, but I agree it's not, maybe not that even a useful thing. This. It's, it's like a thermal group that will compare to the single yeah. side. Yeah. Actually, the, I'm, I'm curious actually what people think about this. I, Tom said, he said it's, this is an essential point. I think he's right, so let me just say it again. And I'm curious to hear what people think about it. So de Sitter space has this amusing property that if you, you fix the cosmological constant and then you put in a black hole of mass m in the center, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. then the entropy decreases. And now if you compute ds dE, where you, you define e to be <coughs> mass, then you get minus 1 over the given hot yeah, temperature. Uh, yeah, but so, so, so how do, how do we think about that minus? I guess we can say we borrow that from the stretched is horizon. What Tom is saying is that you specify the state from the generic state to a more specified state, and this brings down the entropy. But even in, in that recent paper, he shows that, that if you put something in, in that the entanglement entropy causes an area deficit, things go down when you put mass Right. You're, you're specifying more of the degrees of freedom when you put a localized uh, uh, matter configuration in the book. So this is something that matter do, does. It somehow binds some of the whatever whatever you can can excite, make the entanglement entropy, and it makes it less. It actually uh, there's a specific interpretation of it in my paper. I'm not positive it's right, but it's actually a statement of. That the vac we're starting with the vacuum and then we're putting this extra thing in. But if the vacuum is in equilibrium state, it should have maximal entropy. So if I but if I put in some energy, 
that actually corresponds to an addition of sort of entanglement entropy by the variation formula, by the first law of entanglement entropy. But I can't increase the entropy because I was already at maximum entropy. So the horizon has to get smaller so that the, the area contribution to the entropy offsets the increase of the extra stuff I put in. So it's actually in, in this recent paper I wrote, it's the statement that you're at a stationary point, namely the maximum of the local entropy. Now whether that's really physically right, I don't know, but that's the way it works in that calculation. Well, I, I think there's, I'm not sure that you're, you're getting something that to, to Willie and myself is extremely important. So um, one of the things about that formula for the black hole mass in de Sitter space, the black hole entropy in de Sitter space, is that if you take the mass um, much smaller than the, the maximal mass you can have in this inner space, so the Schwarzschild radius of the black hole is much smaller than the radius of this inner space, then you can ask what's the entropy deficit, okay? And this is the minus sign, right, right. okay? And the entropy deficit is E over KT to center. Right. Okay. And I'll leave out the K because God, yeah, seriously. <laughs> it's E over T to center. Okay. When I talk to condensed matter. It's Why? It's I don't want to use the book yet. Okay. So this is a derivation from that formula of the fact that ordinary matter in the center space has a temperature T to center, even though the you'll excuse me for calling it the ground state, the ground state density matrix is, in my interpretation, the maximal entropy density matrix that's possible given the Hilbert space that corresponds to the theory. So the, the degrees of freedom on the horizon have infinite temperature, okay? And the density matrix is completely, um, is completely random. But the energetic things, the localized things, have a temperature because they're constrained states, because of the fact that putting them in decreases the entropy. And that formula gets the right temperature. So, okay. so Tom, just to be clear, when you talk about the entropy de deficit, you're adding the black hole entropy to the horizon entropy? No. Well, it's a very I, take the black hole, I take the black hole space time. Yeah. I count up the area of the two horizons. Yeah. Okay. You add them together. I yeah. add them together. And then you compare and then you compare, and compare, and I compare that to empty de Sitter yeah. space, and it's less. And, it's less yeah. and this is the difference okay. when the black hole that's mass right. is small. So you are that's what I mean. Uh, the black hole entropy is very tiny compared to the change of right. the horizon. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So then the other really important point is that this entropy deficit is much, much bigger than any entropy you could attribute to the black hole itself. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's, if there are n squared degrees of freedom for the black hole, you've set of order n of them to zero. Okay? And this is this story that we tell about how making an energetic thing corresponds to poking holes in the, uh, in the, uh, the set of degrees of freedom that are sort of naturally there in the vacuum. And that works in Minkowski space as well if you give those degrees of freedom on the boundary an appropriate dynamics such that they decouple in the limit of infinite causal diamond. And then in Sitter space, where they don't decouple, because you don't take the causal diamond to infinity, they have an effect and they give rise to the Sitter temperature. Sorry for asking a naive question, but uh, when I take the flat space limit, uh, does this go to zero or it goes to infinity? It goes to infinity, which is... Yeah. So, that's so what happens the, is that there's an infinite set of degrees of freedom, yeah. which you don't see as local field theory degrees of freedom, yeah. but the Hamiltonian is set up so that they decouple yeah. from the local degrees of freedom in the limit that the causal dominant type goes to infinity, so you throw them away. So that corresponds to the fact that in Minkowski space, you have a zero probability of being a non-zero energy state. Right. Exactly. And zero probability of being a non yeah. Right. So these states all have, in, in our Hamiltonian formulation, they have zero energy in the limit 
of infinite causal diamond. Their contribution to the Hamiltonian goes like one over the radius of the of the causal diamond. So, so that means if, I'm, uh, if so, I'm in the if I'm in a nearly flat space, then then I create a black hole, then there is actually a big deficit, but I just don't see it. That's right. So can, can the relativists maybe comment on this energy of the static patch uh, in the sitter space? I mean, if it's, is that a thing? It, you mean, is it well defined? Yeah, or is there some way that you could try and define it? Uh, there is an A in general. Is it an ADM? What? General Tom, ADM. well, that, this T is sort of the, the temperature defined with respect to the static patch, static patch Hamiltonian. Right. Well, there's a killing energy if you're perturbing around the space-time with symmetry, but there's no analog of the ADM energy that's unless right. you mean the entropy of the sitter itself. Yeah, well, well, yeah, that's my confusion. So, so it's, it's a bit like getting the energy of a closed universe, so, which I thought was zero. So, no, yeah. I thought F, F of the or didn't they have to You're talking about there, the E on the board? There are people who the define team. energy yeah. in the sitter, but they take like flat slices. They both um, refer to the killing vector of the, of the symmetric background you're perturbing. But this is a very perturbative uh, right. Yes. statement, right? Right. Yeah. So, so, yeah. so is, it ambiguous at, is it ambiguous at high orders of perturbation? I mean, if there's, you know, sizable back reaction? Uh, yeah, I mean, you, know, you can linearize the approximation, you can define that. Yeah, I agree. Linearized fields in the center, 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 you have a killing energy. Right. Yeah. Yeah. It integrate. But I mean, you know, I could have planets yeah. flying around, big black holes, you know, all kinds of stuff. Well, this, uh, what I did in my recent paper is take the limit of very small little mini to sitter spaces so that even if you have curvature and planets flying around, you just go inside the planet in between two atoms. <laughs> and, you know, and then you still apply a formula like that, and it still corresponds to the Einstein equation. And still corresponds to equilibrium. So if you have a separation of scales like that, base, the basic idea still applies. I think. And then well, does that, yeah. if I if I if I put in a planet, does that energy go up or down? If the state inside my little tiny diamond is not the vacuum, it goes up. Actually, to be caveat, I, I have to actually allow for. Um, comparing to a maximally symmetric little diamond. So uh, there could be a zero point of energy that has to be floating in the, in, until I um, put together all the diamonds. And then the Bianchi identity tells me, fixes that floating point up to an overall constant. I mean, is there some sense in which I can say that the total Hamiltonian is zero? We know that. And then I want to interpret it as sort of h horizon minus h, uh, you know, stuff, um, and then that's where this minus sign comes from, because yeah, really when I put so. energy in the center, I'm borrowing it from the horizon, and then so then that's where it... Well, there's a sense in, well, you I, can I think of H equals zero I guess zero if, you complete, being, if you complete it to the other side, you kind of want to say that, right? Yeah, you so, can think of the H on the left and the H on the right. Yeah, but I, 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 don't, I don't know if a relativist would be happy with that, with the uh, left uh, and right. And, uh, well. <laughs> I know of a yeah, relativist. Right. I know of a relativist, ex excluding present company, who has been happy with that. I think. Anyway. Well, I don't know. I, I don't understand. Okay. So the whole point of this is that the energy is uh, likely just a coarse grained way of looking at it, and that it's really due to these entropic differences. Which turns out um, there's some good arguments. This is actually equivalent to the induced gravity scenario where your entire gravitational action, which you think is whatever gravitates, so that's energy, is really just induced by quantum <coughs> correction. The, 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 uh, there's some RG flow arguments that, that suggest this is equivalent to this idea that everything is um, about, uh, uh, really about entropy. Or, yeah. So coming back to the case, <coughs> by the way, that we it, people think they understand the best, OK? Um, I'd like to raise at least this question of, uh, you know, what what is the collective wisdom of, uh, uh, you know, our sense of what we can really do, and what is the answer? Is it just HKLL? Is it some imagined improvement on HKLL? There's also the question of the uh, you know, trying to get the S matrix. What what do people uh, think is uh, the status uh, in the case that we claim to understand the best? Some of the things. 
So, so these are for states near the vacuum, you know, basically? The yeah, it doesn't state. have to be true for arbitrary states that you reduce to local quantum field theory stuff, as we've already discussed. So say states of ADS that are near vacuum states, sure. HKLL and we're done. For back, I mean for for ADS or for you know perturbations fields in ADS, I think there's no problem. You can get no. local operators. In terms of the, you have all the no modes problems. described by by you know states. Well, there are questions of order order by order and having a controlled approximation. Uh, in some sense, and I think this was something Hermann was driving at, uh, you're using the background. Uh, sure. So, so sure, there are at least two things I could underline there. Use, but, but um, that's supposed to be the ground state. I mean, we start off saying, okay, the ground yeah, state of your okay. field theory is ADS. We just accept yeah. that. Yeah. And now you can use the ADS geometry to <coughs> solve and, uh, to. And I, well, I see the claim. The isometries we've got a symmetry to the boundary. Yeah. Move your points around. Yeah, so, so the ground state is it's pretty clear how you can do things and it There's no obstruction. So the claim is that order or that at finite but small g we're done. We just have to be more careful about it. Well, I, I think if there's something more precise that if <clears throat> so I, I would define ADS CFT being true as at least implying the following statement. If you look at correlation functions of local boundary operators of low dimension, single trace. Mm -hmm. that there is some effective bulk Lagrangian which reproduces those correlation functions order oh. by order in N. Okay, so uh, effective bulk Lagrangian. Some okay. effective bulk yeah. Lagrangian uh, local. Uh, so this is something that, yeah, that should come out in the end. Sure, understand. but I, I just, yeah. I mean, uh, if that's true, yeah. then all the rest of this stuff is sort of automatic. So that, yeah. that so, so you could just focus the, the discussion on that. If, if, well, if you, you want know, to fight about this, we should just fight about that question. But, but <coughs> except for the fact that the HKLL construction pretends to be constructing operators in a filter space, whereas you, you talk about some restricted set of correlation functions that are trying to be calculated. Well, right, but we just had a whole discussion about how HKLL is really a statement about operators on a subspace of states, and the subspace I can construct by looking at these operators I described. Okay, but so what you're saying is there's nothing in HKLL that goes beyond Feynman Wittenberg. No, that's the point. Yeah. Okay. As long as, as long as these boundary correlators are given by Feynman Mitten diagrams, we're done. Mm -hmm. Right. I agree with that. Okay. Um, so so well, you raised some issues earlier, Tom, with the no, no, not with the idea that boundary correlators are given by Feynman Mitten diagrams. Oh, oh yeah, okay. But there's a question so, of getting so, back to the operator. No, but what what Daniel is saying, and this is something I've always agreed with him about yeah. or with anybody who said this, is that it's clear from from if, if that construction works, okay, then we know, kind of following on ideas of Weinberg from the 1960s, we know how to construct a local Lagrangian that will okay. will give rise to all of those those calculations. I learned this from Tom's uh, uh, paper, I should say. Well, uh, so, uh, uh, okay. yeah, so it's, it's the same it's thing it's like it, <clears throat> the way we get field theory out of perturbative string theory of Minkowski space. Yeah. There's a there's a bunch of amplitudes. Some of those amplitudes we know how to yeah. calculate by doing field theory Feynman diagrams, and we know you know how to define the restrictions on those amplitudes so that that's all. Okay. Yeah. So so let's back up. So you're saying not that we should provide a map between the two Hilbert spaces directly, or between the operators that act on the Hilbert spaces. We should use the boundary theory to infer a Lagrangian, and then we should just construct what we call the bulk Hilbert space. Well, the logic is maybe cleanest that way. Mm -hmm. I'd like to just discuss the bulk I mean, algebra. Shouldn't there be a map? I, I, I mean, to me, I'd, there's a subspace of states, and we can talk about the algebra observables. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay, so there should be a map. But it's just that way of thinking, of, I think, follows from the statement I said. <clears throat> So the wisdom of the of everyone here is that HKLL is you know, solvable. If ADS CFT is true, in the sense they said. Well, no, no, we're check. Well, we need to check that. So well, I think on general backgrounds, I think it's a little more tricky because I mean, on, on pure ADS, I'm totally happy with it. Yeah. Uh, in in the no, in, in also because, but on, on another.
your background, I mean, I find it tricky, and especially if you want to use it to go beyond the one, beyond the horizon, this is sort of where it was sometimes used, and then you, you, there you already see that there's an issue. Absolutely. And there it's clearly not enough. Already, I mean, yeah. you just start at the horizon, now it starts earlier. Wasn't well, there already an issue if you just approach the horizon? I mean, that's the regular horizon. That, that, and then in yeah. AES space, if I want to go really, really close, even if I say my GS is, uh, string coupling is small, if I go really, really, really close to the boundary, eventually I'm still going to be probing the, the stringy and quantum gravity physics. So if you where mean, most of the information If you hang from a string, you mean? Yeah. Well, but this would, this would imply doing conformal mappings on the boundary, which are very singular, because yeah. you sort of have to go to cornered frame where you are uh, creating this horizon. And that becomes a quantum gravity curve. Right, I'm just saying we're missing almost all the degrees of freedom that way. So, I mean, in some sense, it's, it's, a, it's a huge. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. That has to do also with the question, actually, maybe it's something we have discussed already, is but whether it makes sense to split the Hilbert space into two, you see. So, because that's the kind of thing you're doing with such singular mm -hmm. conformal mappings. And then you, you go outside of your, your perturbative the picture of ADS space. Okay. Well, we can leave that for now unless others have uh, further comments. Uh, what about some of the other themes, topics? Uh, where, again, you know, where should we be going? What are fruitful avenues? Or what should we cross? Is there something we should cross off the board? Uh, this is a question that was raised. Or that we, things we should not be doing. Well, the workshop was supposed to be quantum gravity UV to IR, so did any of the IR stuff end up being relevant to well, UV stuff? Uh, <laughs> one of our deepest problems is, in some sense, an IR problem, the information problem. So there was a lot of discussion of that in that sense. And there are other IR issues that certainly uh, you know, entered in in various ways uh, to the discussion, you know, how to think about the scattering states. Uh, even how to, in Tom's way of thinking, you know, formulate the dynamics of the theory involves that. Right. And these, these precursors, I think, eventually also become very complicated objects that must involve IR uh, part of the, the physics. Well, the, the standard thing everybody says about that is that it, it, it just involves these very high dimension operators and so on and so forth. It's no, I think it's, it has many soft things around it as well because I mean, the, those precursors are not very clear what they are, what they are and, and, and they may involve a lot of low energy stuff. You say just many low energy things. That, oh. that, that might actually be another way of thinking about them and actually yeah. I think it's even more likely it's made in that way than, mm -hmm. than by some, some very sharp, whatever, high energy mode. It may be a very complicated <coughs> state made up of many, many low energy modes, and certainly in, in the story that, that explains it. It could also be a more, more likely very IR, non-local, but extremely small amplitude excitation, mm -hmm. sort of, of the very high energy modes. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah, this, well, this, here we, I think I would like to connect it to. We're it. doing quantum mechanics, right? You can't have an arbitrarily small amplitude excitation of a mode. Well, you can have it. It won't be. Um, it won't be an orthogonal state in that one mode. But we have so many degrees of freedom, and they're all involved all at once. And a little amplitude. I don't know what it adds up to. Oh, he means the quantum amplitude, not the amplitude of the wave, right? right. Now, yeah. here I have oh, a question for I see. I'm sorry. Yeah. Okay. For, for Daniel, so if you take your, your uh, error correcting code and I uh, take this space, it's a ground state of ADS. I use one of your uh, dangling qubits. I put a qubit in there, and then that information is shared by all the states. Why would it be even a local thing? It's something that has an enormous width, and I can simply spread it over the entire. It's very non local on the boundary. It's very non-local on the boundary, it's very light, but even in the bulk, I might not even see it. Well, but in the bulk, these guys all commute with each other. That's the interesting... No, but I can make, I make, I make, make it... So I use all of them. Let's use all of your dangling qubits. Yeah. I'm going to make one one bit hiding. So I'm going to make a new cube code out of those bits where I make one qubit simply shared by all of them. 
You can do that. I mean, so and then this is a very IR mode, yeah. and it's using a, a highly entangled state. And I would say those kind of states don't have always obvious interpretations in terms of the low energy physics. They're really complicated things that from the boundary might involve. Um, yeah. Well, this is like some state of the gas of gravitons, right? It's like you know the gravitons are all over the place and tangle with each other and some. You know, some because some the, That's how I think. So, Daniel, but your construction doesn't have any place in it this large gap in the spectrum that we think is necessary to have an right. approximate local. Yet you have something that's very local. Well, it's it's only on the, on the, I can make two comments yeah. about that. So the by mm -hmm. my construction, do you mean the tensor network or the more general? The tensor network doesn't have sub ADS yes, locality, so, so that gap is less important. No, but you can add in the, the, the locality in the way I talked about, but the, I think that corresponds to a case where the gap is infinite, right? Because there is having not for mirror that I use that. Yeah, I, I still don't know how to interpret it, maybe. Yeah, I, yeah, I mean, if there is having not for mirror that I use that, then it's infinite. I mean, I, I understand it's not always exact or both, or like two in a row, but uh, in the case, but if most of them are. So your thing would correspond to the gap to the the higher dimension operators being taken to be infinite because the mutual information of two intervals is exactly zero for most of the cases, which means there is no no correction. Yeah, I mean somehow but you can modify the tensors a little bit and take catch that catch that. Well, there should be at least the stress tensor, right? So that you always have that. So, um, so I mean, yeah, I think. Oh, you don't have the stress tensor. No, and neither do I, embarrassingly. <laughs> Okay, so if it's exactly zero, then you lost all the <laughs> low light. Okay. I mean, I have exact space-like commutativity in the bulk. That's bad. That's bad. <laughs> uh, okay. this yeah. the, and not, not in the more general picture, but in the model. <laughs> Other points people want to raise? Is there a firewall or is it? I guess we. It's a little late to bring that up. <laughs> no. There's Don left. Other comments, thoughts? Especially from those of you who have not spoken up. I think super selection sectors should be mentioned, although I have nothing to say about them, but I think it's an important issue. Well, well Ted sort of raised it. I mean, that's yeah. the idea of closed universes might have observables, degrees of freedom, which are not registered on the boundary. Yeah, that, um, that drives at this, you know, that would say there's a coarse graining. You don't have equality there. Yeah, yeah, that says ADS some is form not equal of, to CFT. Some, some form some of cases. coarse graining. Well, or it's only approximately well, in a coarse grain sense. Yeah, so Don and I suggested that the bulk is described by the CFT times another tensor factor, which yeah. only matters for stuff behind the horizon. Well, or it could be some more complicated story, I imagine. Yeah, there's actually some difficulties in making a more complicated story. But the, for example, some, sometimes people want to say, well, maybe these degrees of frame are only there when there's a black hole. <coughs> so the if you have a black hole, there's lots of other degrees of frame, but if you have the ADS vacuum, there isn't. But this actually runs into trouble with the CFT, because there ought to be raising operators and lowering operators that take you from no black hole to black hole. And just the structure of quantum mechanics is such that if you have if you have a bunch of, if you if you try to mess with the degeneracy of states, you'll no longer have uh, uh, well-defined. Uh, uh, so you, 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 if, if the black hole has too many states, then I could raise it to the black hole. But then if I have one of these other black hole states that well, wasn't obtained that way, and I tried to lower it back down to the <coughs> ADS vacuum, something weird would have to happen. There are other kinds of coarse graining, though, like the kinds we're familiar with uh, from the point of view of, say, renormalization group or whatever, where we integrate out short distance degrees of freedom. And I guess, well, I'm not sure if those are, you know, literally thinking of things in terms of tensor factors, or whether it's a little more complicated. No, and what happens all. there is that you yeah. assume that the high energy degrees of freedom are in a particular state, their ground yeah. state. If you don't yeah. do that, then you can the RG doesn't work the same way. You have to add exactly. in extra things. Yeah. 
And in some sense, which the whole way ADS-CFT works uh, is because, in some sense, uh, when you have the very high energy degrees of freedom, in some sense, you have everything because it's just by locality. That's yeah, the long range stuff is just made out of the short range stuff and field there in some entangled way. But the that's just the standard story in ADS for why the boundaries should be able to encode stuff farther into the pole. It's not clear it gets us into the horizon. Well, other comments or uh, thoughts? We haven't touched on everything. Well, one, one question I want to raise. I think that's my simple question. Well, so so if we believe that in ADS, CFT is exactly dual to, to gravity, uh, do we believe the same will hold for flat space time, where we have a matrix on one side and uh, the gra well, gravity on the other side? Or there will be less information in the S matrix than in CFT? So, yeah, it's kind of. That's a step on the way to, to the sitter, right? Where, where it's more complicated. So. Yeah, halfway kind of. <laughs> oh, I don't know. So, um, yeah, what, what, do we, what, what do we think about it? That, that, do we expect us matrix to carry all the information we want to? Yeah, we can possibly get about gravity or not. Um, there, there might be a dual description of quantum gravity and flats and asymptotically flat spaces, which consists of more than the S matrix. Yeah. Does, Does BFS have more point? than the S matrix, Tom? No. No. Yeah, what would that but be? it seems that there could be again, well, some construction, some notion of, you know, diff invariant observables or gauge invariant observables that are relational, uh, that that are useful in certain states. You know, again, they do bad things in bad states, but they might do good things in good states, and uh, effectively reduce to, uh, say, local operators. Uh, so that's at least one. Or suggestion, and of course the question is how to realize that in more well, detail. One other thing that certainly exists in string theory, um, which is not complete localization, and it's certainly not localization in the bulk, is you can define amplitudes for d brains. Mm -hmm. Okay, and those we believe exist to the same degree that we believe anything else exists. Now, for the d zero brains. That's just another sector of the S matrix. Mm -hmm. So the, the amplitudes that you define seem like they depend on you know, a, a D0 brain position someplace in space. Mm -hmm. But if you look at you know, what's actually gauge invariant there for D0 brains, the only thing that's actually going to make sense is the, is the scattering amplitude. Mm -hmm. For higher dimensional brains, if the brain goes off to infinity, you can anchor it at infinity in some way, and then you define scattering amplitudes off the brain that have less symmetry and include the possibility of exciting the brain and sending things off that never get back out as particles but just are excitations on the brain. So there are generalizations of the S matrix in string theory. I <coughs> tend to think of those as sort of you know, um, the way we think of it, in ADS-CFT, you can perturb ADS space by adding a relevant operator to the conformal field theory, and then you get a, another space-time which doesn't have the symmetries of ADS and sort of has something sitting somewhere in ADS. And I'm not <laughs> saying that thing is a D-brain, mm -hmm. but that it's, it's an analog of, mm -hmm. of what the way I think about the D-brain Theories. Its dynamics is completely determined by the dynamics of the CFT, because mm -hmm. you can calculate everything by calculating CFT correlators and perturbation theory. But um, and, and similarly, we can calculate all of these deep brain S matrices from the rules that we know in perturbative string theory, you know, with the slight modifications that Joe Polchinski taught us. So. There, there are other observables in that sense, but they all have this S matrix character. They're all somehow anchored off at infinity in asymptotically yeah. flat well, space. Yeah, also they seem to be in a different super selection sector, yeah, because if I start from no D brain, yeah, you, can't, you can't make a state with an infinite D brain. Yeah. You can 
create pairs of D0 brains. Yeah. But that will just be another sector of the S matrix that you missed in perturbation theory. They're <coughs> like solitone. But doesn't it, wouldn't you think, like if you just look at the CFT and the usual idea of CFT and compare that to what you imagine being the in and out states in the S matrix in asymptotically flat space, there's just so much more in the CFT. And it, N is very large and you know, it just seems like the asymptotic form of the gravitational degrees of freedom is just nowhere near enough. It, presumably, you have to have, like, most of this, most of the Hilbert space would be these extra sectors. Well, I also say it's also too much in another sense, because when we, we have to be careful what we, would be the appropriate analog of ABS-CFT in flat space. People say the S matrix, but I don't think that's right. Because if you know your theory, even in a flat, even in quantum field theory with no gravity, it's possible to work out your state if you know the uh, state at uh, scry minus or scry plus. The really surprising thing about ADS-CFT is not that you can work out your state from the boundary, which is a co-dimension one surface. The surprising thing is that you can work out your state essentially from a slice of the boundary, which is a co-dimension two surface. So holography, people often use holography in the sloppy ways to refer to co-dimension one surfaces, but should really be co-dimension two surfaces, including in flat space time. So I would think a flat space time holography is if you can somehow reconstruct everything that's going to come out to null infinity if you know everything that's true at space-like infinity, right. yeah. which is co-dimension two in some sense. Yeah. By the way, if you know, since apparently you know most people feel the answer, or at least those who are willing to speak up feel the answer to this is affirmative, that or, that the HKLL takes care of it, then you know you just work at pretty large R and uh, you know small GS, and you can basically construct local bulk observables more or less, and uh, you're done. So. Well, the limit is three years, you know. Uh, well, part of it. Well. If, if you buy everything that was just uh, it will. Uh, well, if, if you think that this is answered in the affirmative by HKLL, I think you're done. Well, it, it, it's not as strong as that because, really? it, at least in the way that Daniel and I were just talking about, you can only use those observables to calculate asymptotic quantities. You don't know what else you can do with them. Oh, no. Well, well you're supposed to match on both no, no, the both yeah. propagators. Yeah, that's what well, what's the claim the, is. That you can yeah. literally get field operators in the. Yeah, you get the. You get the, the there are gauge invariant <coughs> bulk operators that are defined order by order in perturbation theory, and you can get those from the 1 over n expansion in the CFT. You can compute their expectation values. Uh, but we think that in principle is enough, at least I think, that. It's in principle enough to know all the boundary correlation functions. Yeah, that was the point. Well, that's the that was what I was arguing. Well, okay. but only yeah, the H K L L. When you plug in the formula, you're in the end you're always just computing some boundary oh, okay. correlation okay. functions and then integrating them against some. Okay. Yeah, that, yeah, and that's what I meant by phrasing it. This way. starting with say some correlators, can you, you know, write down a formula that say gives you correlators of bulk uh, yeah. effective field operators? Just about out of time. Anything? Is there this tour or something? Yeah, if people yeah. are interested, uh, just probably this is a good time to try. I, you can go, go, go look at the insides of uh, atoms. <laughs> so, so this alloy is super nova. It started at 12, but oh, I was okay. told if we go now, we could, we could still see it. Okay. Um, it's kind of a spherical projection room where you stand inside the sphere, and it's been used for various data visualization projects. I don't know how well developed it is, but that's the story. And um, I can, I think I know where it is. So how about if we meet by the door um, of the lobby next to the main seminar room at 12.30 exactly. OK. That how far away is it? Right across the street. Just across the Right, right across the Oh, it's just a just the next building. Yeah. 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 I'd like to thank Steve for everything he's done yeah, for yeah. organizing. Yeah. Yeah.